So, hello everyone. I'm Angela Voss and welcome to another creative conversation between the Centre for Myth, Cosmology and the Sacred and friends and colleagues who join us in bridging the gap between spiritual practice and their scholarship. Today I'm delighted to welcome a very old friend of mine, Marie Angelo, who I've known for probably over 30 years or so, like um, since we first met at the conference of the uh, London Convivium for Archetypal Studies, I think it was, many, many years ago. Um, and we've both followed very similar paths. And it's interesting that we have mirror image names in that my name is, is Angela Mary and Marie is Marie Angelo, which is a little bit more poetic than, than my name. Um, but I've always felt that was very significant in some way. Um, so we've both been involved in um, transformative education in uh, various academic institutions. Marie ran a um, MA in transpersonal arts and practice at the University of Chichester for many years um, and is now running her own alchemical school based on a um, alchem alchemical manuscript called the Spendor Solis, which I'm sure she'll tell us more about. Um, and I know that Marie's spiritual path has deeply informed her scholarship um, and it would be very interesting today to talk a little bit more about the tensions and conflicts between the academic world and, and following one's, one's path or one's calling um, and what it means to try and uh, marry these two things and what it means to try and bring spirituality into the academy if it can indeed be done. So we've both emerged um, sort of out of the academy now in, in many ways. Um, so it'll be lovely to reflect back on, um, on your life, Marie, and how you've negotiated this. Um, and maybe just start off by telling us a little bit about your early life and how you first became interested in esoteric subjects and you know, as you, when you were a child or a young person, what, what were your main, main interests? It's lovely that you ask that, Angela, because you sent me on a mission back into the, the past and I'm, some lovely little points came to me and I was thinking, you know, I've, I've always had the esoteric connection and other things have added onto that, or I'm trying to explain, but it was right from, the, there's never been a time when it didn't seem self-evident, the things about the esoteric life. And my family was uh, very uh, happy to talk about it. My father in particular was you have these wonderful conversations around the table about mind over matter and possibilities of things. And my mother's background is French and Catholic, but not practicing. And she actually always loved Jewish festivals. And she used, I think she yearned to be a Jewish mama, you know, with the, with the ritual of the Friday and the ceremony. She was a tremendous uh, maker of events, ceremony as it were. And we always talked about, and as a teenager, I was a searcher. I went to the spiritualist church, I went to the Theosophical Society, I talked to all the wonderful old ladies in the health food shop who, who knew about things and I always wanted to find a way in and I did as a teenager. Um, I found a, a lovely teacher through a friend I was studying, I'd just gone back to college to begin some time and he advised me and he said, no, that you, you don't realise that you need to train your mind as well as everything else. And I didn't know at the time that I was a bit clever. I hadn't understood that. I just felt different and awkward and so on. So he, he advised me to, to do A-levels and university and so on. So my family wasn't a university family and I was going to be the first person if I did that. And um, we, I did psychology because they didn't do philosophy. This was at college and it was the beginning of psychology as an A-level and the, it was nobody knew anything about it. The psychology teacher was an English teacher who'd been told to teach psychology. So he bought a book. <laughs> but my friend and I discovered 
this wonderful stuff about Jung and about doing practical things. And I think this all fed into the fact that my teacher was then beginning to run a private group. And this was because his teacher in London was now not able to teach. And her name, Agatha Mills, Dr. Mills, she had studied in Egypt, in Cairo. And there's a connection there, which is to do with um, the wonderfulness of a mystery school, which doesn't lend itself to the critical reasoning intellect, but lends itself to the truth um, that's known inwardly. And she had those connections and she had wonderful material um, from the 1900s, 1908, 1920. And she came to teach in London um, in the 40s and 50s. And then my teacher was the student and he learned and she passed it to him. And so he was teaching in my area um, he was a psychiatrist with a Jungian background and uh, so he had lots of practical studies and so forth. And we had this wonderful group from when I was a late teenager, every oh. week, and we'd have lessons and lectures, the sort of thing that you might find in um, uh, theosophical literature, um, spiritual literature. And the, the emphasis was always, don't believe this, don't take anything just because someone says so, feel into it. Um, different worlds of being, subtle substances, chakras, um, many lifetimes. Don't just put it to one side, don't believe it. Feel into it and try it out. And of course, this is the thing for me, it's empirical. It's why I liked psychology, because you, you become a practitioner. And this is why I loved the idea that you make your own ritual of life but well informed. You know, the, the, you know the, the, we talk about the eye of the heart and opening the heart, but of course the head in uh, alchemy is also a microcosm. So there's the heart within the head. And of course in Kabbalah, which is something I've studied enormously, the tree of life, uh, there are four worlds and they overlap in this fantastically beautiful ladder, Jacob's ladder, so that the, the heart the sun, we correlate it with, sun behind the sun would be the star, and it moves on up through the worlds. So there's this fabulous opening of possibility, but at the same time, it's very centered and practical. So what do you do? Mm. And we would have lessons, but we'd also do, we learned visionary imagination. We learnt uh, fabulous courses of studying the tree of life and the pathways and the tarot. And we we practiced how to do it. And of course, I've been doing this all along, which mm. is jolly nearly 50 years. You made me realize that, Angela. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's nearly 50 years. And it's a practice that happened because the alchemists say, um, you must do repetition. Mm. And this is one of the great secrets. There's, I think there's two words that I would just pull out of the whole thing, which is one of them is alignment and the other is repetition. And that's one of the things that differentiates the, um, the alchemical from the um, ordinary therapeutic and, and psychotherapy. I'm supposed to be talking about academic background, am I? Is that right? Oh, no, they're not supposed to be talking about anything. It's fine, it's great. <laughs> the thing is, these things weave together. Yes. And this, yes. I would say, a, a big theme for me has always been it's very hard, if not impossible, for me to just do one level because my natural feeling is for all the levels at once, um, informing each other. Well, that's and the thing about esoteric philosophy, isn't it? And esoteric traditions is that they're incredibly integrated and that they understand that all levels of knowing actually work together. Yeah. Not something that the academic world understands. Exactly. So the challenges that people like you and, and me and, you know, and others have had in trying to integrate these worlds have been enormous. And so I wonder what, what led you into wanting to bring this world into an academic framework? Well, let's think. One of the key things, again, another word I've written down is sulfur, anger, um, or, or you might say righteous indignation. Um, when I had done um, lots of study, I, I did my first um, A-levels and things. I went off and did my first degree. 
I got caught up into the business world and I spent seven years, I realised, again, looking at it, um, doing um, industrial things like market research and consultancy and organisational work. And did, I actually did a, a Master of Science in Occupational Psychology about how we use time in our day work. And I became um, angry at the manipulative nature of advertising because I was one of the people at the time who was researching how to manipulate people and I realize it now I did it, it was very wonderful work in some ways it was great fun it was qualitative research into people's preferences for things like whether they prefer a, a vacuum cleaner that's upright or um, <laughs> <laughs> lower a little shape and the, the people couldn't understand why, um, why the housewife was preferring the upright. And I went and did all these research all over the country. We do these qualitative inquiry groups with um, stream of consciousness and personification and lots of, lots of fun, actually, and, and fantastically well paid, I have to say. And I, I discovered that the housewife was um, a little bit cautious of the, uh, the cylinder that cleaner because it was a bit continental and the upright was like a sort of traditional husband that was all very uh, reliable and, and predictable and a bit heavy going and the cylinder was continental and had this long Freudian type hose that could penetrate even behind the sofa and it had that frisson that was a little bit awkward at, at that time and so because of my research, they tweaked the advertising to make the cylinder into a friendly little dog. And you'll still see today people, um, the advertising, uh, putting these machines, the robots, as friendly little creatures. And while I was doing all this, I was getting more and more distressed because I realised that what we had, I called it imaginal illiteracy. Mm. And it's not because we're stupid, it's because we haven't been taught. And that's something I'd really, I used to teach A-level psychology to mature students and the ladies who came to study, mostly ladies. I would say to them, you're not stupid, it's just nobody ever showed you. And of course you can do statistics and things, it's just bit by bit, let's not be frightened by it, let's just take it in steps. And it was very, you know, I love doing that sort of teaching. And so we, um, I was able to take that anger and that's what I took into my doctorate. And then I was, I just finished privately this huge esoteric course on the tree of life as the Grail Castle, which is called the Western mystery tradition. And so I made my entire doctorate a thank you to the angel of the tree or the diva of the tree, because I had met this diva um, quite by surprise, at the very end of my huge bit of, um, um, I suppose it was, actually did, it took me seven years to do this esoteric training. Um, and I had this wonderful castle in the astral light, filled with every pathway, every co correspondence, living nature, the media, it was beautiful. But I didn't know what to do with it because I'd finished the course. And then one day, um, I haven't really spoken about this before, but one day, by surprise, the whole castle, which I knew every inch of, changed into the angel behind me. It was up the spine. It was like, like uh, you know, the beautiful wing, the radiance, the glory, the zvana of it. Um, I thought shivering just to speak it, but it was, it was a, an absolutely transformative and wonderful and very intimate and personal experience which you know, it's quite hard to talk about those special things it's a sort of I don't know it's almost like a sort of love making you know you, you wouldn't want to to expose yourself too much but I just mention it there because I didn't know Corbin's work at the time Henri Corbin but of course subsequently I discovered that this is exactly what they write about in, mm. in the Recit. and so I went into the doctorate um, which is about active imagination as an education for imaginal liter literacy. 
Um, you know, nobody's free to become what they can't imagine, these are sorts of training. But I went into it with this knowledge that you could work in the subtle matter and that it has this plasticity that the, what we call the archetypes, it gets a bit clunky in, in Jung sometimes. And Hillman, who's absolutely, I wrote so much in my research about Hillman's work, Hillman has this more poetic approach. And I called it plasticity. I said, these living powers, we can meet them as people. And that's more familiar, you know, personification, we call it. Um, but Hillman says, no, it's, it's um, them coming to us. As people. It's not us putting them into people. It's, it's the living power is coming to us as a personage. But also they are landscapes, they're places, and they're inner processes, and they're powers. And that the, the archetype has, you know, that's archetype is, is the, the personage, but there's, there's archetopos, the, 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 the setting, the context. And I, um, I rewrote my doctorate into a book for my students when I ran the MA, and it was called A Place for the Magus, the idea of imaginal space. And um, Ed Casey wrote very nicely about this, a getting placed soul in space. I've always been <sighs> delighted by the context the cosmos around us, what I call the cosmos of the alchemists, the living cosmos. So I began to get that into the doctorate. So um, you must have had a very sympathetic advisor, supervisor. Oh, he had not a clue what was going <laughs> on. And this is the case all the way down the line. Um, an absolutely wonderful person, Peter Abbs, who's a poet. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. Educated, absolutely um, delightful. And, and Brian Bates, who, who'd been my uh, tutor at Sussex as an undergraduate. He came in to be an external examiner and um, Peter Tatham, who's a, who's a Jungian external. But um, what, what Peter loved was, was the fact that I was exploring. Um, and I, I actually, of course, turned it a little bit to suit. He'd done a lot of work on autobiography. So I ended up this fantastically complicated journey through cognitive psychology, which abstracts image, um, into depth psychology, a lot about you know, how Freud into Jung and Hillman, and then height psychology, as it's sometimes called, the transpersonal, as Sagioli's work. And I said, let's, let's look at how this takes shape through Renaissance. So then I had the background that, um, as you know, Hillman had uh, of, of uh, Ficino, so you and I connect on that. Uh, but I said, but what about Giordano Bruno? That's the kind of Jungian stage, <laughs> as it were. And uh, then what about the, the, um, the tree of life? So I put forward, eventually, after these endless chapters of really complicated mm. stuff, I put forward the tree of life as a, um, uh, an archetype of relationships because of this sort of Rosetta Stone, it, everything, uh, it's the way that things connect. And you will know Antoine Febvre's work on, on um, characteristics of esoteric thought. And that was such a delight to get hold of that eventually, because that wasn't until the 1990s. So uh, when, when did you do your doctorate, Marie? When did I do it? Hang on. <laughs> I know when I did it because I got it written down. Um, I finished it in 1993. Right. So that was before... Well, that was almost exactly the same time as me, in fact, because I finished in 1992, which oh. is interesting, you know, that we were both sort of pioneering or trying to pioneer a completely new way of writing about the imaginal within an academic context. But I, I have to say my doctorate was a failure in that instance because I, I in order to um, to work with the material, what I did was make an empirical course. I started running um, a course at the local adult education centre and renting um, classrooms and things. And I ran courses called the Imaginal Tree. Now they were informed. You have to always remember that in my background, every single week um, is this esoteric meeting with lectures, with ritual with a temple, with meditation, with discussion. And this is going on all the time. It's this beautiful 
it's like the light on in the background, as it were. And then there's me studying psychology, doing all these degrees, um, being angry about imaginal literacy, making, wanting the doctorate. So I left London in order to do that. I gave up. People said, you must be bonkers, a job like that. I said, I don't want it. I, and I went and did adult education teaching part time in order to finance myself through the doctorate. And I ran a course. And the course doesn't appear in the doctorate because there was no way that I could do something empirical mm. in the doctorate. It had to be uh, entirely theoretical. It was in psychology, I guess. Then. Well, it was in the it turned it was in education. It, so, it, so it was the overlap between education and psychology because Peter's a, an educationalist. So I wrote about uh, making an argument for imaginal intelligence. Right and about an archetype that um, expresses relationships. Um, and I wrote a, that I'd done a course, and it was in the appendix, all my best bits. And I'd done all this empirical work. I'd made a beautiful course. I'd put it on tape. Uh, it was, um, you know, learning in intervisionary imagination, guided fantasy of a particular type. Because I'd, I'd discovered a, a problem with Hillman's work for me, which, of course, is that he's a poor and he doesn't like the Senex. And so there's no, the spirit is always portrayed as some grumpy old chap on a cloud in that, not really, but you know what I mean. And, and there isn't, there isn't the um, structure. And I remember talking to him about this. I used to liaise with him a bit about the London Convivium because I was a trustee at, the, at one point. And um, I remember him, him in a, a lovely talk he was giving and he said, well, of course, he said, I. I never do any of this. He said, the coach never plays. And I thought, oh, how could you avoid that? That's, you can't do everything. I mean, he was a poet as, uh, and a visionary, but he, he didn't have a, a way of doing it. He used to just criticize um, active imagination and guided fantasy. And I thought, but I know esoterically about what we used to call path working. I still didn't really know Corbat. I didn't know the mystical receipt, the, the whole journey. But I was arguing with Hillman in my doctorate about um, you need to reclaim the, the Senex in a healthy way. Put, the, put that broken archetype together and then you've got the pole of the world. He said, well, that's exactly what, it, what is missing in most educational contexts. Yes, well, it's Hillman is isn't it? To yes. yeah. Sorry, I'm getting excited here, but yes. it's, it's um, Hillman said, this is the problem. It's a cultural problem. It's, it's um, age that cannot teach and youth that cannot learn. And this is the broken archetype. And so I, I was, uh, because I've had this spatial imagination, I'm very, it's a very visual imagination. Um, I could see sort of depth and height needing to to be married and of course the the term we would use then is the imaginal it's yes. like Corbett said that's the metaphysical catastrophe that's his words yes, yes, yes. that we've lost the the middle place of imagery so were you feeling that um by completing a phd and then by creating a course within a university you were hoping to, to actually bring this middle place you know, into, a, into an academic context. Is that, was that your kind of yeah, I, I aim? I didn't have that as a conscious aim, <clears throat> excuse me, because initially, <clears throat> initially I wanted the doctorate in order to train my mind right. in a sort of critical mode. Yeah. Because I knew I had had actually a very bad education. It was a sort of private school and at, at school, but it was ghastly. I, didn't, I don't remember learning anything in particular, which is what made me a good teacher because I, I knew that I didn't know anything. So I was always trying to find things to help people take steps into learning. But uh, after the doctorate, I then worked at the American University in London for a few years. And so I, I developed a multicultural psychology degree and, and uh, I did a lot of that work and it wasn't really until somewhat later when I took a job at Chichester which was actually to teach counselling because you know I've done so many different courses and things I, I'd um, I got this uh, 
British Psychological Society. So I'm chartered as a counselling psychologist and an occupational psychologist and a research and teaching psychologist. These are all sort of postdoctoral type things. So I thought, well, I could teach counselling. And I went to teach on a counselling degree part time because I couldn't manage the American system anymore. It's so labour intensive on assessment. Mm. Uh, it's just incredibly difficult. And, and also I'd wanted to make a master's degree there and they weren't open to it for, for what I wanted to do. So I thought I'd, I need, that's when I needed to, to begin something else. So I went to work part time. It was another give up a big London job and go to a tiny job to do something quite different. And keep teaching counselling is another strand because what people possibly don't know is, is that in... Um, counselling training, the skills that are needed are exactly the same as the skills for qualitative inquiry. This is my strand of method coming in again, mm -hmm. that you need to be able to do what I'm not doing now, which is listen. You're doing it beautifully, but you have to learn to listen. Um, you have to learn um, phenomenological bracketing. You don't usually call it that because people can't get the word out half the time but um, it's it's the way of trying to understand what you're projecting onto something so that you can put that aside it's like parting the curtains um, and the, of course the way we describe it is that most of the therapeutic world will make use of images as mirrors Yes. But this is an, another big strand of my sulphur that, that, again, Hillman said, I trust my sulphur, gets me to, to do the work. And I could see that imagery is just used and it becomes a mirror where somebody projects and then notices their own stuff. Yeah. And of course, that's useful when you want to share that with your therapist and together you can understand why do I perceive this beautiful picture is somehow a picture of somebody being bullied oh you know reflects back that you have a you know you're being bullied but that that art of seeing the, the council needs to learn quite a bit of that so I was interested in how I could teach quite a lot of that and I think Jung said didn't he that what is most necessary is to teach the art of seeing and I think Hillman too said um the uh, teaching the person to be to, to be adequate to the image is, is three quarters of the work. Absolutely. I mean, and it's modes of perception that yeah. characterise you know, these great thinkers that you know, yeah. to move away from perceiving things literally to perceiving things metaphorically. And it's a huge thing to need to do. And so yeah. you know, teaching counselling had that uh, skills teaching within yeah. it. And I then got the opportunity to make the master's degree and so how did that come about me me and my friend who was teaching counseling i mean we used to, quite frankly we used to skip along the corridor together and she was a dancer basically jill love, lovely person and and we used to skip along the corridor creating a three-hour workshop for the students as we went and go in and do it because so much of the counselling training was in small groups and practical work and we'd done all the background so we, it was so light-hearted and uh, between us we said wouldn't it be lovely to run some modules and I created one which was called vision and supervision hyphenating <laughs> you know Hillman loved that little play with words mm. also supervision and um, that that was a playful approach and I'd written an, uh, two or three things and published a couple of bits on that that kind of work and it was initially going to go into a religious studies master's degree and then um, I think it was just they were open to it they said well if you want to build it up you know through through this counseling and supervision and supervision and so I ended up with really a license to do whatever I liked. Mm. Um, and partly it was a little bit as it was with my supervisor for the doctorate, that they didn't really know what was going on. As long as I had that line, I used to call it the, the stream bed of the critical thinking. 
That, that's so interesting, Marie, because, you know, that's so parallel to the kind of work I've been doing and treading this fine line between knowing that what you're actually doing is something really quite deep and transformative, but having to actually, um, uh, you know, produce it and articulate it in the language of those who will understand it in an academic way. Yeah. And, you know, we've both had to do that, I think, with the courses that we've been running. And it's, and it's an interesting experience, isn't it? To try and kind of yeah. be authentic as possible to what you really want to do, but speak in a different language. I was looking, because you'd asked me to, I went back and looked at the curriculum and such like, which was a bit <laughs> challenging. I thought, crikey, I wrote all those boring things. But, um, I think what was interesting was that the assignments had, they were based on people's um, reflective journal. Yes. And I brought that in from the counselling training because there's, yeah. people have to develop as counsellors in that way. And we expanded it. So I now call it sort of Jung's red book, sort of red book research where you, you make rough notes and, and then you, you it, you rework them into something beautiful. So we had um, proportions very carefully worked out for assessment. There would be the journal and there would be extract edited. There would be artifacts that were the results of, of people's studies. And those could be performances as well as artworks and embroideries or collages or whatever, rituals, whatever it was. And, but there would be this stream bed of a, of a critical commentary and they needed to integrate those three parts. Mm. And in some ways, I, was, I used to think to myself, truthfully, what I've got here is about seven times as much work to do as anybody else who's running a, a master's. Because in an ordinary master's, all you would need is the critical commentary. Yeah. And I, I used to smile because I thought this is not a mystery school. We're not bringing the mysteries into the academy, really. We are doing some of the, what we used to call the lesser mysteries, the sort of personality training. Okay. Uh, there's, because a real mystery school, the curriculum is the same and you do the same thing for seven years and you go to a different level each time. So I used to say, well, this is a bit like we're trying to do a master's degree in all the worlds. And to an extent, it works. But the onus on the teacher is enormous. Mm. Because yeah. It's not ordinary teaching. It has this um, connectedness with the world, mm. and responsibilities for people, which usually... Now, remembering again, I've got the mystery school in the background all the time, and that's a community for life. And it's very different when people come in to study, and obviously people come and go because everybody has where they can go in any particular life. But the premise of a mystery school isn't something that you go and do for a year or two and then go off and do something else. It's I know exactly what you mean, and that, that's, that's, that's been the challenge for what we've been doing too. And we've often had debates you know, amongst the students and, and, and my colleagues about can academic study be a mystery school and are we actually providing some kind of lesser mysteries, you know, by um, the material of the course and, and how we're interacting with the students. And, and, but as you say, the repetitiveness of it, you know, always sort of having to take every two years, every year, going back to the beginning again. Um, I think most of our students would have argued that it actually it is a kind of mystery school because the transformation that happens through the studying of these materials is goes very deep and you know we've had students who've been completely and utterly transformed in their lives through the topics they studied so I think this this is really interesting this knife edge between well, is it a mystery school or is it not a mystery school? And if it's not, then how do the mysteries fit into it? You know, and can it only fully be a mystery school once it's left the academic context? Yeah, I think it's an awkward marriage between mm. critical intellect and this imagination as a path of knowledge, for example. And we would say it's like the psychology 
psyche and logos it's not a happy marriage um, Hillman said psychology should be about the myth of psyche and eros and I think it depends what you're in service to because the mysteries are, as we know they're not things to solve they're wonders to serve and it's through love and I think all the while the intention is eventually is that somebody should have an academic certificate for their professional development for their for their work I think that stops it right actually I think a lot of what's done is very similar and joyful I think there's a huge onus on the teacher who learns of course more than any of the students mm. because of the repetition and the work and there will be a community that I found I used to run this every once a month as a Saturday workshop and, and start to develop um, uh, distance learning in between and this was before there was any way of doing it properly any structures and what would happen is the students kept coming back and by the end I, I did it as a one-year course as you know at the end um, and I recorded the whole thing and I had in that group I had students from about five years of the MA uh, because people would at the end of it they'd always say well now I'm ready to begin I, mean, I wrote a piece about the very first workshop and it was called inviting the image to teach that was for the the Jungian harvest mm. journal yeah. and it's about looking at one is first of the very wonderful splendor solace images and it was how to learn to feel invited um, to look without making um, all those projections. You know, people look at it and say, oh, it's wonderful. So, you know, that's your emotional response. What's actually there? It's really difficult. We used to laugh about this. How to look, how to really take time to notice um, and then to go into the image and explore and be invited in and to discover what we call a place to stand uh, to, to, to have information that educates the eye. I mean, you know this image well, I'm sure. I think it's on your website as well. Well, we, you know, we've been inspired by your work on that. In fact, you know, it was your MA at To Disturb that inspired us to create the, the journaling and the creative projects for our MA as well. So what was it that actually brought it, brought it to an end? Because I'm interested in, you know, it's, it's usually some kind of bureaucratic reason that's given for these courses ending, but I, I have a sense that there's, that there's a sort of higher or deeper work here that's going on, maybe telling us that it's time to move on or that, that we've reached some kind of limit to what the academy can hold in a way. Did you, did you feel that? I think so. When I look at it in terms of my own life, it was the right moment to move. Um, I was going to be needed for other things. I needed yeah. to become a carer. I needed to do uh, other development. And I would have got caught out of a sort of duty and responsibility. Yeah. And just about introducing all sorts of other things, which I would have probably found I had to, you know, they, would I like to be head of department? Would I like to? I thought, oh, I probably would have said yes. Mm. And I'm actually fantastically grateful. And it was bureaucratic. And it was a load of kind of stitch up silliness and one doesn't even want to go there but the result of it was fantastic because I got a year with a full salary well no the first thing that was fantastic was I got to run the one-year course and record it uh, which deepened my connections and I don't know how I managed it because they by that time I didn't even have a secretary <laughs> I was just all on my own with it totally illegal I should imagine and um, I then actually took with me a whole group of students who were of the mystical school mind. He said, well, that's just the beginning, obviously. And this is where we said things like, well, um, that was the journey through the underworld. Yes. And that, when you think about it, that was 2011, when we had the final graduation. It's a long time ago. Yeah. yeah. There were 22, lovely symbology, 22 students graduated. And then this whole group wanted to, I, I, I started teaching privately. And ever since then, I've had the private group and we've been through 
the whole work in far more detail. Yeah. And again, I recorded it all. It's all been transcribed. This is all lovely material that's just waiting for me to, to um, do more with it. And um, I think that you're right. It was the right moment. Mm. And it was the nudge from life events that at the time felt quite difficult. And you think, oh, after all that work with these wretched documents and, and so on. And I had loads of people who wanted to do the course and yeah, so no well. support. And I think I possibly would have just burnt out because mm -hmm. another problem with the mystery school part is that you will have other staff who are semi-interested and with interesting things to offer, but they don't have the vision. Mm. And this is one of the problems, of course, with psychology, that it, it only takes you so far. Yeah. It goes to the, the, the window, but it doesn't look out. Yeah. You know, it's mirrors. And then it, there isn't a door. There isn't the door onto the sacred ground. That is so beautifully put, Marie, because I was just musing on the fact that, so yours finished in 2011, and, you know, we started at Christchurch in 2014 and kind of took up the mantle, as it were, yeah. and now we're finishing in 2021, um, and for exactly the same reasons. And, you know, I've had exactly the same sort of similar kind of life crises, which forced me out as it were thinking at the time oh this is terrible you know I wanted to become a professor and and all these things and now I realizing of course it was the best thing that could have happened because as you say there's a limit at which you've got to be able to move through that window with people and there's an impossibility within those structures to do that yeah. so how have you moved through the window then with your group I've had the most wonderful time. I've had, um, I started it quite formally and then it became more informal because I, I, as you know, I was a carer. And so I used to say to people, um, we'll just do what we can. And if I need to do other things, they'll come to the house. And I'm fortunate to have this house, which was built by my great, great uncle and it's quite spacious. So I've got this nice room full of books and there's a big classroom and I can have a temple if I want. I can have, reading room you know it's quite it's not huge but it's big enough for the right size of group and people came yeah. and they come each month and then I've been really connected to that and written all this lovely material and what we've been doing Angela as you know is I met the Spendor Solis which is the pinnacle of alchemical art and I, I met the Spendor Solis over 20 years ago I had this prepared eye from all the, from all the esoteric work. So the moment I saw it, um, and it was the first publication that had been of the pictures in colour. It was terribly bad prints. It was published in 1993. And I had this opportunity. I was at Richmond University in 1997, and I was hosting the London Convivium Conference on the Artist as Guide to Soul Making. And uh, Hillman was coming with his friends and that. And Noel, who, who was running the, the convivium, um, said I could do a paper. So, you, you know, you have to be careful what you ask for because you get it. And so suddenly I was going to present to Hillman, who was like, oh, my goodness. And I thought, well, I don't know about art. I'm not trained. I actually went to art college for a year, but I'm not a good artist. I've done all sorts of, you know, I went to dancing college for a year, all sorts of things. But I'm not an uh, but I suddenly understood that the Splendor Solis images are beautiful art as well as the distillation of like 17 centuries of wisdom about transformative practice. And I had the beautiful reprographics department at the American University and they made me slides. This was before PowerPoints and everything. Slides. And I presented them to Hillman and everybody at this conference. This 22 extraordinary images as a pilgrim's journey and as I did so because I'd already done this huge amount of work with the tree of life and with the tarot um, and with all the imaginal language Hebrew the sacred letters the correspondences and so forth that was all there that angel this is my grail castle which became it's always with me 
and would, will tell me these things. Um, is, is, a, is a connection and a teacher for me and has this wonderful spiritual connection. And so as I was showing the pictures, I began to tell them as a journey, which was in the visionary imagination and uh, had this spiritual possibilities. And somebody afterwards came up and said, oh, would you come and show those pictures to my friends as, as a Christmas present for them? You'd be like the magician at the party. And it was one of those London people with an enormous setup, you know, with grand piano in the corner. So I was the, the exhibit and I showed the pictures. I said, you could spend a, a month, a year with each of these. You could go into the landscapes. And they said, well, can we do it then? This would, this would be in 1998, uh, something like that. And I went up to London once a month to show these slides to them. And that made it into a course. So the minute I then got to Chichester, I knew that there was a, I was already running this course in the background. I brought the pictures in and formed the MA around them. And when I remade the MA halfway through, you know, you do a revalidation, I focused it on the images as, as the um, focal point and subsequently made it that. So what, what's lovely for me is that what I'm teaching, I'm not saying, look at me. I'm a student. I'm an apprentice. I'm not the head of this academy, I'm, you know, the Splendor Solis Academy. I'm a, a student. And what I'm doing is point, I'm saying, look, there's, you know, the Taj Mahal. There's the Sistine Chapel, as it were. You know, there they are. So I'm much more like a tour guide. And Would of course, you like to just show us your your book and um, your latest project, your book and the tarot cards, which is so exquisite, Marie. That's the book cover. Um, what? Hold on a minute. Um, what people may not know, um, when you there's a box over. I, have I got the cards? Some of them are in the other room, but I've got a few of them here. They're all spread out in the classroom next door <laughs> for something I'm doing. The tarot cards have the animate sun on the back and the book has the animate sun on the front. I should just point out that this is a recent project that you've designed yourself um, from the Splendor Solis Manuscript. Uh, yes, I mean, it's been there all along. But what I decided to do was to produce it as a tarot first. If I waited till everything else was done, it would be about 10 years. And I wanted to type. This came out last year. Yes. And what you have here are the 22 original images. <clears throat> and what they are is unbound from the manuscript. Yes. The manuscript is about 400 years ago. And I think they've been bound in the manuscript of Seven Treaties all along. So I feel excited to think I had... You know, when I met them, I knew them. They're old friends of mine. They're my teachers. And I, I've known that all along. So I, I meet them as personages, living powers. And in this um, image here, in the preface, um, the animate sun there is the key because that shows us that we're in the animate cosmos, the living cosmos of the alchemists, and everything follows from that. And there's all sorts of wonderful things that one can work with just on that first image. It's an absolutely beautiful project, Marie. Really. It's just... Yes, and these have been very beautifully produced by the publisher as well, because I don't know if you can see the gold. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 On in there. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I was able to... Um, to develop from this as an art project, uh, a minor arcana as well, um, which are all, they all go together with a little book in the treasure box, which is that box, can you, I don't know if you can see yes. the box. Yes, that probably, this one, in the yeah. box. But um, there's also a, uh, <clears throat> a larger edition of the book. Mm. It's the same book, 
um, but it's larger. So you've actually got these wonderful pictures. And the thing I suppose I'd like to say more than anything, um, see there's the, so you get the close-ups. So I'd like to say more than anything is that the book is a prospectus for the Splendor Solis Academy. So it's tarot because I, I love the fact that tarot, tarot is this kind of egalitarian, um, friendly. But the images are often abused, I think. It's one of my angers. You know, people have taken these wonderful images and simply put them in black and white, chopped the frames off, um, announced that they're to do with Freudian reductionist goodness okay. knows what, um, or they just project onto them their own stuff and make them into some rather sad little pilgrim's progress full of misery and, and shame or troubles of various kinds. I think, oh, I mean, the images can look after themselves. I know that they're, they're beautiful living powers, but to have this opportunity to um, present the academy and the principle of the academy is the animate sun. And so the, I've just been piloting a new course to introduce the work of, of visionary imagination. And the animate son is, is doing the teaching. And I'm the apprentice alchemist who uh, joins the students. In the book, there's two other things to mention. One of them is that um, the unbound nature of the cards means that they can be understood like an alphabet. There's a whole, I, I call it an encyclopedia, an encyclopedia um, of mystical correspondences. Um, so they go through all the words, like the letters of the alphabet. There's infinite ways. And they're also an ascent and a descent. And they're also um, pathways on the tree of life. And they also gather into temples of initiation. So, of course, I'm always speaking from inside the mysteries and the subtitle of the book being Inner Alchemies of Mithraic Light. And um, you will know because I gave you your people a talk on Mithra uh, last, was it last year? Uh, a couple of years ago, I think now. Yeah. Whatever it was, it was quite fairly recent. And that the whole of, the, I think one of my missions, it's another thing I get this sort of sulphur about, is that I know the Mithraic mysteries a little from the inside they're very ancient they they come from usually it's written about possibly from ancient persia so corban's work is is uh, filled it's a philosophy of light temples of light and it predates all sorts of things and in fact we've got in our massive archive from the mystery school which is housed here as well um, uh, we have uh, all sorts of extra literature and um, works. So there's a lot to do with ancient Egypt. And I was very fascinated to find, uh, for example, Zosimus, very early alchemist, telling us that um, the secret of all alchemy is the Mithraic mystery. And so this is what I work with, this mystery of light shining through. So the Splendor Solis Academy this website is being made as we speak. So hopefully by the time anybody's looking at this, you'll be able to go and look at it. Um, if, people would, if people would like to um, buy your, your book and tarot cards, how would they, would they oh, contact you? Or? Um, they could do. In order to get this lovely, this is a collector's edition, the big one, and it's got all these pictures. Let me just find you. Because it's also got the minor arcana that I was able to develop oh. from the... Um, these are the fiery ones. Um, it's actually filled with alchemical um, Kabbalistic lore. These are some of the. No, I'm, I'm sorry, absolutely. Uh, the wonderful awakeners, who are the um, the uh, court cards as priests and priestesses of the temples. So this is this, for example, you can see. Is it she? One yeah. this is the priestess queen. Of the starry yeah. water and she dwells beneath the cherubic wings and those wings are derived from the splendor solace from the welcoming angel 
I mean, what a, a satisfying project, really, to, to oh. have been involved in. It must have just yeah. been absolute bliss. Well, I've got all these wonderful people. I'm companioned by them. And you say, oh, you're all right living alone, you know, because of what's happened. But um, I feel very companioned. Yes. They're all there. And I don't know if you can see that the alchemist is up there. And that up there is one of the um, developments of the, uh, those are the 10 uh, court cards. Um, no, they're the ambassadors for, for the um, sparkling air. So there's a, a lovely richness that the academy has this huge faculty, all the staff. So the principal is the animate son and there's all these wonderful teachers. In order to get a copy, um, as I say, this large book is a collector's edition only from the publishers, and they are called Alchemia. Okay. Which is A-L-C-H-I-M-I-A, -I -I Alchemia. And they would have to go to um, www.alchemiapublishing.com. Okay, thank you. Um, but if people wanted to come to me and talk to me, I'd be so happy. And they're going to be able to go to the Splendor Solis Academy website, but uh, my other website is Imaginal Studies. So they could simply go to that website, www.imaginalstudies.org. www.imaginalstudies.org. And mm -hmm. There's some bits and pieces and things and uh, email address and such like. You can tell that I can talk for England. <laughs> the more we get into it's this. It's just been absolutely lovely, Marie. Honestly, it's just been great. We will have to draw to a close now, but I kind of feel there are many more conversations to be had. It would be lovely. It would be lovely maybe if you could you know, contribute something on alchemy, particularly. Um, for us, because I think it's a very little known, li little understood. Uh, do you know, can I just finish with this, this point? It's come to my notice just recently that I'm being quite indulgent. I made the tarot book, but the, all the other work, I was thinking bit by bit by bit. But no, actually, on the, on the Splendor Solis Academy website, I've already made, I'm going to put it up for the, uh, the fabulous um, winter solstice, Saturn Jupiter. We've all been great. Yes, um, I've made I've made a visitors gallery, and it's a little visitor. It's not little actually. It's a visitors gallery with a, a a little. I suppose it's a PowerPoint, hopefully a video for each of the twenty two great artisans, and it's to take you as a visitor into some close ups with what I call the secrets of seeing, which are the beginning of those hints and tips to get the prepared eye. A bit of, you know, phenomenological bracketing, a little bit of hermeneutic, a bit of actual information. So, you know, that's not a shield that fell to the ground. That's heraldry. That's how it should be. The sun isn't automatically a man. You know, I've had students say, oh, I don't want to do this. It's got a man, you know, shields and helmets it's worried no learn more um the sun isn't always masculine this sun isn't a man that face is actually male and female yeah depending it doesn't have to be and you know mythology there is there are myths of the man in the moon and there's myths of the sun as a goddess mm -hmm. let's open our eyes with good cognitive knowledge, but let's put it in service to love, to the mysteries. That's the only way. Well, I couldn't agree more. And I think what you're doing is absolutely amazing and fantastic. And it seems that, you know, since you left the academy, as it were, you've just completely blossomed into being able to yeah. form your own mystery school with the Splendor Service Academy. It's and great. lovely to know more about it. So I'm sure we'll have more conversations and we'll definitely put up the links to, to it you know, when we, when we um, put the video up online. Um, and thank you so much, Marie, for, for sharing your exciting journey. Thank you. And may it be the start of, of, yeah. of yeah. some 
perhaps some collaborations now between what we're doing and what you're doing because I think we're we're very much on the same page yeah. um, in terms of what we're trying to offer the world you know in our different ways um, through the imagination so great thank you so much the light shining through isn't it yeah yes I would love to come and give you all a course if you'd like all sorts and also because I'm I'm not profit making because the mysteries are never sold they're always given so everything I do is not is a part of that not-for-profit it's just for the joy can I just say that it's that feeling of being the ant who got into the granary you know <laughs> <laughs> trying to lug out a grain that's way too big just delighted with it yeah so okay well we'll definitely speak again soon thank you so much Thank you.